In the Life is funded in part by the H. Van Ameringen Foundation, Arcus Foundation, the estate of Richard W. Wyland, and by the annual support of In the Life members like you. Coming up on In the Life, encore presentations of three stories from our archive. First, how a work of art inspired a fight against teen suicide. Art has an enormous capacity to change people's lives and to open their hearts. Then, a conversation with Edmund White and Doric Wilson. With Stonewall, we started coming out in the daylight. Not Twilight people anymore. Yeah. And finally, a celebration of the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence. Putting a faith on is definitely about respecting that tradition of the, the Sisters of God before me. For over 10 years, The Trevor Project, a crisis hotline designed specifically for LGBT youth at risk, has offered support 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. The origins of The Trevor Project lie in a little theater in Manhattan's Lower East Side. In the short play Word of Mouth, writer and actor James Lacine drew from his own experiences to tell a story of gay teen suicide. The play later became a short film simply called Trevor. Hey, hi, I'm James Lacine and um, welcome to my place. This is my office desk and this is where the Trevor Project all began. At the time, I was putting together the material for the show that I was doing called Word of Mouth. That particular day I was listening to the radio and I was listening to a report on NPR about gay teen suicide. And at the time it was 33% of all gay teen suicides that they know of uh, were attributable to homosexuality. I got the idea to actually write something about gay teen suicide that was personal. So I sat down and I started writing. There was an incredible opportunity to tell a particular story about a particular boy. And, you know, I drew on a lot of my own experiences of growing up. I grew up on the other side of the George Washington Bridge in a little town in New Jersey called Hasbrook Heights. I'm going to take you now to the place where Trevor was first performed as a stage play, okay? So this is the famous La Mama Theater, and this is where I first performed Word of Mouth and Trevor, and we're going to go inside. Wow. The incredible thing about La Mama is that it's like a piece of New York history. It's where like sort of theater began in the like 60s. The amazing thing is it hasn't changed at all. And please, if it's possible, play Endless Love at my funeral. It's my absolute fate. Don't cry too much. It would have been like a skillion times worse if I had lived. Your loving son, Trevor. <laughs> I met James the scene because I went to see his show, Word of Mouth, down at La Mama. And it truly was one of the best one-man shows I'd ever seen. I just knew that I had been incredibly touched by the piece and that I found myself laughing and crying at the same time, which isn't an experience I get that often. The light bulb that went off in my head was, I have to call Randy Stone. Randy was a casting director, and I thought, he's got to see this guy, he's got to see this piece. It happened that Randy Stone uh, was in town the next day. He came to see the show. And Randy walked out, and I could tell he had been crying and had been as moved by it as I had. And Randy came out and said to me immediately, we need to turn this into a film. I can't come The 
The thing about Trevor, it sort of seemed like a miracle. It came together so quickly. And then we got the call that Trevor had been nominated for an Academy Award. But they weren't only nominated. They won the Oscar for Best Short Film in 1995. When it happened, it was almost like, it, OK, well, that's amazing. And that kind of an experience, when you hear your name on the Oscars, I think there's this sense that it, it just becomes very unreal. We sold it to HBO, and we got Ellen DeGeneres to do an amazing back, uh, wraparound presentation. Hi, I'm Ellen DeGeneres, and I would like you to uh, watch this next movie. This was right at the point that Ellen had first come out, so she was white hot. She was on the cover of everything. It really was at that point that we knew the film was going to be on air that The Trevor Project was born. I quickly did research and realized there was no one who had um, a hotline that was focused on and dedicated to kids who were gay or questioning. It just seemed like we had to do it. The first call center, we hooked up with a um, an existing suicide prevention helpline in LA. And now it's, you know, we've been able to actually have call centers at the Trevor offices in LA, in Washington, DC. There is a call center here, which was opened this past year in memory of Randy Stone, who died last year. Trevor Helpline, this is a niche. The Randy Stone Call Center. We're here in Lower Manhattan in the Financial District, so we have uh, room for four of our counselor stations. We're here 24-7, that we're the nation's only suicide and crisis intervention helpline for LGBT youth and questioning youth. I have been a counselor on the Trevor Project since September of 2007. I wanted to be a counselor on, for the Trevor Project because I grew up in a very small town, and um, I felt that I was alone and different. As I grew older, I really felt that I wanted to be a support system for other kids who felt that way growing up. What's it like to be a counselor? I can tell you that no two phone calls are the same. Every youth that reaches out to us has something different going on in their life. But one of the, a lot of the common themes are that they're feeling alone, they're feeling scared, and they're feeling isolated. A good counselor can help ameliorate some of those feelings that they're having. We are answering over 12,000 calls a year from youth all across the country. Most of our calls come from right here, in this region here, the Midwest and southern parts of the country. I would say our average age of our caller is 15. What motivates me to do this and to give myself to these kids is the fact that they're just kids. You know, they deserve to have a wonderful, healthy, happy life. We have an annual fundraising event here in New York City called Trevor New York. We're going to be honoring Alan Cumming for his superior work in film and television. We're celebrating our 10th anniversary year, and we've got lots of entertainment. Adina Menzel, Sandra Bernhard, it's a little bit of music, a little bit of comedy, Alec Mappa. So it's a great evening. Lots of stars and celebrities come out for it. The Colin Higgins Foundation gives out uh, three awards every year to youth who have triumphed over adversity. These are gay teens. And so at our event, we are more than honored to be able to bestow those awards out. They come with a $10,000 uh, grant to each individual. Our final youth honoree is Perry Shelton, the youngest poet ever featured on HBO's Russell Simmons Presents Death Poetry. Receiving this award is exceptional. It makes me feel like all this work that has been done, that the creator has used me for, it, it, it's, it's being listened to. My mom doesn't even know that I've had thoughts of suicide, and, and it's obviously because I never told her. Young people need somebody to talk to, and that's all. The Trevor Project and people who are associated with will listen. I hear a lot of pain from a lot of our callers, but what constantly makes me feel so amazing is that there are so many great volunteers who take time out of their lives to answer these phone calls and talk to young people who are feeling so much in their lives. Great! And again! I really believe deep in my heart and always have believed that art has an enormous capacity to change people's lives and to open their hearts. And that's what I wanted to be a part of. I've definitely decided to live. Uh, through tomorrow. <laughs> I 
challenged my school's no same-sex date policy at prom because they would not let me go with my girlfriend. That's why I stood up, so that I could make my, my portion of the difference. I hope to inspire people to stand up and also make a change. I mean, you were you were sort of a satanic figure because you were always in leather. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Edmund White and Doric uh, Wilson are powerful writers, I, I critics, have, uh, even old friends. We brought them together to discuss their firsthand accounts of the Stonewall riots and how bearing witness to the uprising impacted their work and views of the LGBT experience. You you were active in the very beginning of gay theater. Technically, the first modern gay plays uh, were done at the Cafe Chino on Cornelia Street, written by myself, Lanford Wilson, Robert Patrick. We never realized that what we were doing was brave. Of my four Chino plays, two are gay plays, in so, in so much that they were open gay characters. They don't discuss being gay. Uh -huh. That's not what the subject matter of the plays are. Which play is that? Uh, Pretty People. There's an out character in it that has no, no stereotypes. He just happens to be a very attractive young man, and he's gay. I so mean, I, You might not have been surprised by it, but I think I was, that, that, I, well, I that think openly we, gay material is being Everybody used. was. We didn't think yeah. about it. How did you uh, uh, decide to write about gay subject matter? Actually, how did you? <laughs> well, for me, I'm sure it was a lot more tormented than for you. I mean, I think in my case, I... I had actually written a gay novel in the 60s, which was pretty good. And it went to 25 publishers and it was turned down, oftentimes by editors who themselves were gay, and who years later told me, you know, I really liked that book of yours, but I didn't dare accept it because people would have known I was gay. I don't know that gay liberation per se had any direct response to gay culture. Oh, I think it did. I think it absolutely did because, for instance, there were organizations that... See, I moved to Rome in 1970, and by the time I came back a year later, I was shocked by how different everything was so, because it was very dramatic for me. And, when I, and one of the things that was happening was the uh, Gay Academic Union, which would have these meetings where people Sorry, would say... Sorry, you're right. You're right. People, I, I people, think of the movement, I think of the activist movements. Yeah, I but there were these yes. intellectual movements, yeah. and I remember being invited by student organizations to Princeton, to different gay organizations, uh, student ones, that later died out. Gay liberation originally and first and foremost meant for us sexual liberation. It meant sexual opportunity, because what a lot of people forget is that, is that, is that there were very, it was very hard for gay and lesbian people to meet each other. Yeah. I, I agree with you that it gave, gave sexual freedom, but I also think it gave identity. Absolutely. Through, all, through education, uh, education and programs. And the identity was of a minority group rather than of a sickness. Yes, oh yeah. After the World's Fair in 64 yeah. or so, the mayor was uh, always closing gay bars. He was closing them before, before the, world, the World's Fair. Because he wanted to clean the city up yeah. for the World's Fair. And the idea was that tourists would be appalled and disgusted if they saw any gay activity. Little realizing that many people would come to New York for that. Maybe around 66 or 7, gay bars began to reopen, and then there were quite a few of them, and there were a lot, many more visible gay people on the street. Yes, and, and more people were coming out. Yeah. And I arrived in New York out. I've always been out. I came out in the 50s in a wheat ranch town yeah. high school in yeah. Washington State. But it, but it was very rare. I know. Then, when all the bars began to reopen, Everybody thought, oh, phew, that horrible period is over, and, uh, and now we're going to be free. And so when the stone wall was raided and closed, I think it really upset people because it seemed like a throwback to a, well, also, a slightly uh, earlier in, era. In that era, when bars were raided, they were never raided on the weekend. They were always raided on a slow night because the police and the bar owners had agreements. It wasn't the police raid, no. it was the ATF yeah. who raided, yes. because they had found out that the police were in collusion yeah. with the mafia owners. I mean, of course, what's famous about Stonewall is that the customers resisted. Instead well, of the, the, what's, actually, what happened, 
all the customers got out on the sidewalk and the police were trapped inside not knowing there was no back exit out of this tunnel. I was there. Oh, I, I didn't know. Sorry. I was there. No, I was there because I just happened to be walking past. Me too. I wasn't actually in the bar, nor did I go to that bar no, very no, often. No. But I was walking past with a friend, and of course we were intrigued, and we stayed there. And I was so awful and middle class that I kept trying to get everybody to calm down. Oh, come <laughs> on, guys. You know. and, but even in spite of myself, in spite of my awful bourgeois self-hatred, I uh, found myself excited. People weren't angry. First of all, there was astonishment that we were doing it. And, and when we would say things like, uh, slogans like, gay is good, uh, patterned after black is beautiful, yeah. It struck us as hilarious. Yes, there was a great, great gleefulness about it. But there was also a feeling that it was preposterous because, after all, it was really at Stonewall, I think, that people, like gay people, first realized that they might be something like a minority group yes. rather than a medical diagnosis. Because up till then, we were sick. Yeah. And there was always some point in the evening where we'd all say, oh, God, we're sick. And then... Oh, get, some. Yeah, right, right. And the, but, I but, never had a problem with it. Well, you probably didn't, but everybody else Every, did. Well, not everybody else did. No. The kind of the world you lived in. Yeah. Most of the people I knew didn't. I was in therapy for years and years trying to go straight. <laughs> and all this, I was engaged twice. You know, the yeah. typical middle class person suffering over the whole thing. And then the, the wonderful thing about Stonewall for jerks like me was that it, it was liberating. Yes. The gay world was in the dark. The term, one of the terms for it at the time was the twilight world. At twilight, gays came out from under their rocks or whatever. Sure. And with Stonewall, we started coming out in the daylight. Not twilight people anymore. Yeah, not twilight people anymore. Yeah. John Irving wrote you an open letter. And I think he mentions in it that the gay marriage phenomenon going on at the moment uh, revitalizes the movement. Yes, I mean, John Irving lives in Vermont. He's a straight man, of course, the great writer of the world, according to Garp, and so many other wonderful books. And he was very active in campaigning for it in Vermont. And it does look as if that is the current big issue. I mean, for people like me who, who never liked marriage and, and also didn't like the idea that gay people should be assimilated to the, to the mainstream <laughs> community, that's now a lost cause, and, and, and I've given up on it. And what I now see is, is that, that, that the marriage issue goes right to where people live. I mean, it, it's all right to say, yes, you gay people can have job security, and yes, you gay people can produce your musicals or whatever. But when you want to get married, it, it feels like one of the central institutions of our society, and especially when you want to adopt children or have children of your own. It's funny, we don't change, you and I, bottom line. I don't <laughs> think we do. No, I guess not. Well, we're, uh, we're still here, and, yeah. uh, and, and it, it's, it's really been great to uh, see you again. Yes, indeed. I was raised Christian, and my spirituality has never waned. God had been whispering in my ear for a very long time, stand up and tell your truth. The minute I acquiesced to my truth and realized, oh, you're coming out, my life got kind of magical and much, much easier. of nuns, what comes to mind? Black flowing habits? Strict Catholic school rules? You probably don't think of men in painted faces or silver lame. But the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence defy all expectation with their unapologetic brand of humor. Since their first appearance in San Francisco on Easter Sunday in 1979, the Sisters have used the power of parody and their irreverent wit to educate, entertain and raise money for local charities. We are 21st century nuns. I want to tell you a little bit about what it takes to become a sister. You start as an aspirant and you aspire for a couple of months. We use the term ministry very loosely because my ministry is making someone laugh, putting a smile on somebody's face and raising money for groups that cannot. We have sisters that are very spiritual. Um, we do a lot of outreach work in hospices and hospitals. Uh, we all touch a different aspect of the community, and that is our entire ministry. Once you're done aspiring, you start to perspire, and you become a postulant. 
once you're a postulant, you work on that for a while and you learn to put on makeup. We view our, our appearances as canvases. So this is the canvas, the blank canvas. We paint the canvas white first, and then we add our own interpretation of who we are. After that, you become a novice, and after that, you become a fully professed sister. Everyone is so afraid of humor and laughter. This is a joke. I mean, it's not mocking someone, but it's opening you up. It's the idea of the holy fool, the ancient idea that there's someone who stands looking completely absurd and gives you permission to say things completely true and honestly without any misperception or covering or avoidance or hypocrisy. My sister, Rita Terror. As a member in the order. As a member in the order. Of the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence. Of the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence. Dedicate myself to public service. Dedicate myself to public service. Social activism. Social activism. And spiritual enlightenment. And spiritual enlightenment. Not all sisters originally wore white face um, in the beginning, uh, but Sister Adahana Risvara. Um, did to protect her anonymity and over time it's become tradition. It's not every day you see a man in a nun's habit with clown makeup on and that can be very jarring to those who don't understand it. This was me last Easter when we um, did the zombie Easter and so I decided to come as Saint Rita. The sisters really started in 1979 and with a few guys wanting to do something a little different on an Easter Sunday and has grown into this organization of 500 plus nuns around the world. We were bored and I had brought some Catholic nuns habits from Iowa with me. We threw them on, we went out into the community and the reaction was so strong that we decided to form a social activism, uh, social service organization in San Francisco. The organization was formed with the intent of performing community service, performing theater, um, street theater, and to educate the public on social and health issues. We realized right away that the nun's habit contains a lot of social stigmas all in one. Gender issues, gender identity issues, and, and religious bigotry issues. Uh, so the habit to us is, is like a lightning bolt. I think one of the biggest misconceptions about sisters is that people think we mock nuns, but what I'm doing is I'm celebrating a very old vocation that women have carried for centuries, and all I'm doing is for this century, I'm taking it outside to the other side of the convent walls, and I'm finding those people that wouldn't step into a church or a temple or a synagogue, but who need just some loving touch and some care and some sensitivity. Putting a faith on, um, is definitely about respecting that tradition of the, the sisters of God before me and made it, you know, made this a trademark in a sense. This is a flag that Sister Phyllis rode in AIDS Life Like a Win. AIDS hit the order as hard as it hit every other organization. The order in 1981 was about 20 people strong. By 1987, it had been reduced down to six. We did the world's first AIDS benefit before the acronym AIDS was coined. AIDS really, in many ways, allowed that spirituality to come out. You know, it, it, it took people to a place they hadn't been driven to before. So that by 1982, 83, 84, that's probably one of the main focuses of the order, is educating the public about HIV and AIDS, raising money to fight it, um, doing what they can to save as many people as possible. We do a lot of service in providing funds available. We provide grants. This last year, we actually provided $85,000 worth of money out to our community here in San Francisco for bisexual, transgender, gay, lesbian, healthcare, homeless, any kind of providing where there's a little bit underfunded here in the city. In San Francisco, we raise over $200,000 a year. It's in direct ministry, 100% in, 100% out. We buy our own jewelry. Uh, we make our own wimples, so there's no overhead being a nun. There are three things the sisters do, in my opinion. Fundraising, fun raising, and consciousness raising. And occasionally a good old-fashioned barn raising, if we have time. <laughs>
Thank you for watching In the Life. To learn more about the issues in tonight's stories and how they affect you, visit our website at inthelifetv.org. You can also watch extended interviews, sign up for monthly air date alerts, and download past episodes 24-7. In the Life is funded in part by the H. Van Ameringen Foundation, Arcus Foundation, the estate of Richard W. Wyland, and by the annual support of In the Life members like you.